Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our first sessions of Asia German Waterfalls Continuous Education. My name is Jury from Index Holding Singapore, your host for the evening. Allow me to introduce our moderator for tonight, Professor Go Chi Liok, who is our scientific committee chairman of Asia Derma. Professor Go will share with us some house rules on raising questions during the sessions. I will now hand over to Professor Go to introduce our speakers and programs for tonight. Professor, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this, uh, this webinar, the first of, uh, uh, from the Index Asia. And uh, today's topic is on safe dermatology practice in the era of COVID-19. And I'm sure all of you are very familiar with what's going on. So I want to introduce a few words about the uh, COVID-19 uh, infections that's going on the pandemic, which is a pandemic uh, for quite some time. Um, let me just share my screen with you first. How do I get this up? Hang on a while. Yeah. Okay, so the first cluster of the, um, oops, it's not going in. Yes, as you know, the first cluster of the COVID-19 uh, cases was reported in Wuhan uh, in December 2019. And not long after that, the disease has spread exponentially across the globe. And the World Health Organization eventually declared COVID-19 as a pandemic on the 12th of March 2020. And since then, this pan pandemic has infected more than 8 million people across the world with about 500,000 people, half a million deaths reported related to COVID-19 infection. And uh, to date, about 3 million people who were infected actually has recovered uh, uh, all over the world. Now in Singapore, the first reported case appeared on the 23rd of January, and then local transmission became apparent by February. And I'm sure it's also the same in many other countries. And by March, we had so many, quite a number of clusters and because of foreign workers who lives in uh, dormitories in Singapore. Now, so the question is that we handle, especially dermatologists handle uh, patients and we are not aware of their, their infection. And recent report has indicated that you can get asymptomatic carrier. So what is the risk of healthcare workers becomes infected? Now, there's a study that was published in JAMA recently, uh, in May 2021. Uh, uh, the title is Coronavirus 2019 Infection Among Health Healthcare Workers and the Implications for Prevention Measures in the Tertiary Hospital in Wuhan. And they estimated, or the report calculated, that the risk of healthcare workers working in a hospital handling suspected and infected people is about 1.1%. And this is despite we using uh, PPEs. And this is the type of PPEs that uh, our workers wear. Actually, they have a gown, they have a mask, they have um, a shield, they wear a cap. And uh, in a very hot environment like Singapore, uh, it causes a lot of discomfort to the patient. So the question then is that, what is the suitable PPE for the various procedures that we have to carry out with. And we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. John Sullivan uh, to give us a, uh, a talk on the uh, various preventive measures using PPEs, the when to use PPEs, and uh, the, the right way to use the PPE. So this is the program for today. And uh, uh, Sull John Sullivan from Sydney, uh, Kingsway Dermatology and Aesthetic, uh, will give his, uh, talk, his talk on this uh, prevention, I mean, the, uh, the various measures to be taken. And uh, my colleague from KK Hospital in Singapore, Dr. Lee Hui Chen, will review the PPEs that are used uh, in um, uh, COVID-19 prevention and the sequelae of using these PPEs uh, high and how to prevent them. So this is the program, uh, my introduction is almost complete. 
and uh, Dr. Sullivan will talk on safe practice for practitioners as well as for patient safety during this COVID-19 era. And Dr. Lee will talk about prevention and management of skin reactions from PPE in healthcare workers. And then we have a question and answer session. In between, if there are any question and answer, you are most welcome to submit your question and answer on the uh, Q&A uh, icon. If you look at your screen at the bottom or uh, the top, depending on which device you use, uh, you can click on it and you open up a box and you can then uh, send in your questions and we will answer them uh, when appropriate. And we should end by 2.30 uh, 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 this evening. So this is how you answer the question and answer. You click on the icon at the bottom of the screen q and a and then you, there's a pop-up screen that shows up and then you just type it in and the moderator myself and the uh, speakers will then be able to see, read your questions and we will answer you uh, accordingly so send your question in as you come along okay so now it is my pleasure to call upon uh, dr john sullivan uh, to give his talk on the um, on the, uh, the uh, how do we or what should we do uh, the various guidelines on preventing and ensure safety uh, for dermatologists, medical practitioners, and also safety for the patient. Uh, John, please. Okay, so thank you very much, um, Prof Go. And I'm just like I said, transitioning to my slides here. Um, and I'll just check that they're being shared correctly. So you can see my slides okay there by the looks of it. Um, so thank you very much for asking me to be involved today. And as you said, this has been very interesting times this year um, and it's gonna to continue to change as the year goes along. Um, and as you said, we always looked to sort of Asia and Singapore as experts in this area with your experience with SARS before and Australia was relatively untouched with that. So when things first hit, I actually sort of read a bit about what happened in, in Singapore first, but as you're aware, you know, um, this has completely changed um, medicine, our practice and our approach to patient safety this year. Um, and the main sort of aim is to really sort of contain this disease and, and stop sort of infection spread because at this stage, you know, we don't have really the effective treatments um, and the best, best um, current strategy is prevention. Um, and I suppose a good part is that it really is just reviewing our strategies to prevent nosocomial infections, making sure they're appropriate for COVID and learning from the past. And the good part is, I think a lot of our strategies from the past have proved very useful for COVID. Um, so today I'll sort of briefly go through a range of um, topics. So briefly about COVID, which you all know an awful lot about already. And I think everywhere's gonna be a bit different that um, each government will have their own restrictions. There might be other issues with, regarding the availability of PPE. Um, but most importantly, you know, we've got to look after our own reputational and medical legal risks and we really don't want to be responsible for causing infection in our patients and particularly our, our vulnerable patients. Um, I'll go briefly regarding the, through the tr transmission of um, SARS-CoV-2, um, particularly aerosol generating procedures, um, those with laser plumes. Um, and everyone probably has their own guidelines from different countries about, you know, screening of patients, how our clinics should be set up, social distancing, but I'll briefly touch on all of these as well, especially how it's relevant in Australia and from the literature. Um, but, you know, one of the key things is, you know, cleaning and disinfecting and making sure we're doing it regularly and we do it to all the relevant fomites in our, in our clinic. Um, and when it comes to dermatology, you know, laser and energy-based devices are a big part of what we do um, and just ways we can do this better than we, we probably were doing before COVID hit. Um, and I'll go through a bit as mentioned by Dr. Um, Prof Go about the different risks of different tr treatment sites, the different procedures we do, and touch on aesthetic um, injections and specific things that might be relevant there. Um, so you've all heard and seen this before. So um, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, um, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. It gets its name from the corona or crown. Um, and as you've heard, we've had this rapidly evolving and changing pandemic around the world. But because at this stage, you know, it can cause a fatal respiratory infection and quite an inflammatory and vasculitic um, infection and prothrombotic thing, you know, it can be a very serious disease and it can affect anyone with those severe symptoms and, and features. But, you know, the key part, although there's some promising reports, we really don't have specific therapies, antivirals, 
and the adjuvant ones that are well established. And we're really waiting and hoping for a vaccine to help change things in the near future that I, I don't think we can rely on um, herd immunity. So touching on things that you've already just heard, so it emerged in Wuhan, China in late 2019, but it was declared in March this year a, a global pandemic. Um, human human transmission was re, um, reported a bit earlier in this year and it only has a relatively short incubation time for a lot of people of around two days but through to about 14 days. Key symptoms when we're screening for include sort of high fever, dry cough, dyspnea, headache um, and even sort of diarrhea. Um, but the big thing with this one unlike the SARS that we had over a decade ago is it um, a highly infective respiratory spread pathogen. The respiratory droplets are sort of key and they can either be inhaled or deposited on the mucosa. But a big sort of problem potentially in nosocomial infections is sort of fomite um, transmission from contaminated surfaces and it's sought to be auto inoculation from say touch and then touching your face, be it your lips, nose or, or around your eyes. Um, but when it comes to all the things I'm saying today, it really is based on our, our current um, evidence and they're sort of guiding principles and there really are sort of good infectious disease precautions and safety precautions that we should be doing. But for dermatology, it is quite important um, regarding a lot of these because a lot of our procedures are focused around the head and neck along with our examination and places like the nose, mouth, eyes and mucosal surfaces are areas of high potential um, SARS-CoV-2 exposure. And for a lot of the things we do, you know, it does involve close proximity and you know, we'll often be examining the patients over a significant period of time or, or many of our procedures will take 15 minutes or more and you know, for more complex things a lot longer. And as touched on, um, we've got to consider plumes and aerosols and their potential risks. And a lot of this still remains theoretical when it comes to dermatology that fortunately we don't have a lot of literature of problems um, from the, the dermatology setting. Um, and I think at the moment we do have to consider everyone potentially infective or susceptible to, to infection. But hopefully with you know, more mass population screening, better um, serological tests, um, you know, maybe this will sort of change. Um, vaccines will hopefully sort of help us return more to our normality, but I don't think things will ever quite be the same again after this, um, this pandemic. Um, so patient screening, um, again, this will sort of continue, continue to change and should be guided by your own um, sort of local government. Um, I've got one from the CDC there, but you know, the, the key part is we really have to protect particularly our vulnerable patients and those who are as vulnerable to you know, potentially severe or fatal COVID infection. So for, for people, we've, we've still got a sort of triage regarding sort of their need to sort of come into the clinic, um, do what we can by telehealth and, you know, for a lot of monitoring of disease, uh, telehealth we, we, by video or phone may be appropriate. But prior to attendance to the clinic, it's important that we do sort of check in the day before, um, make sure that they haven't been diagnosed with a COVID infection, make sure they haven't been told they need to self-isolate or be in quarantine or if they've been in contact with someone who does to do a screening for the symptoms I've mentioned, and particularly you know, check if they've had any exposure to someone with COVID in that last 14 days, and other high risk exposures would include you know, recent international travel or cruise trip travel. Um, and all of this could be done just by telephone or, or telehealth where appropriate. Um, and when you come to our clinic, gone has some of the, the nicer sort of touches there. Um, again, when they arrive, they've got to have the patient screening with the, the questions as they arrive at reception, make sure nothing's changed. And often, you know, patients do need to be quizzed a few times to get the answer right. Um, we have alcohol hand rub as they arrive and also in, in each room as they, they go in. Um, and where possible, social distancing is important in the clinic setting. Um, and we do temp temperature checking when they arrive with a, a no contact um, method. And I, again, this is sort of very standard for Australia. Um, but as you sort of know, most infections have come from that close unprotected um, contact with sort of family um, gatherings, weddings, um, sort of on ships and other places, sort of close office spaces. But, you know, one of the more recent things reported around the world are sort of meat processing plants where you've got the cold um, refrigerated areas, lots of shiny um, non-porous surfaces, which we know the virus loves. Um, but I suppose as mentioned, you know, there is the possibility for nosocomial transmission. Luckily, this hasn't been a major factor in this pandemic. And, you know, some studies coming from Hong Kong and Singapore 
in China early on sort of showed that with right precautions, you know, this, these risks can be reduced and hopefully prevented. But key to our practice and following of these is, you know, our reputational medical leaveable risk, but also, you know, staff and patient safety, they should be sort of key in this pandemic. Um, so background, there's a lot of fomites, which are great relevance in the, um, the clinical setting. Um, and they're really divided into porous ones. And these are surfaces such as paper, wood or cloth, um, which the virus can survive on for maybe just a few hours, a few to a few days. But the more smooth surfaces or ones such as plastic, glass or stainless steel, studies have shown that the virus can survive for up to four or more days. And of course, in lower temperatures is, is a, a bigger problem. Higher temperatures, um, the virus doesn't survive as long, but I think a lot of our offices are sort of air conditioned and the, the temperature is controlled. Um, but I'll move on to the next slide, but just highlight some of the, the fomites and surfaces in our clinic, we've got to sort of make sure we handle and clean well. And there's just been one sort of outlier, the, the mask where one study showed that the virus might survive up to seven days on the outside. But I think you've got to presume at least four days for these sort of fomites. Um, so one of the key things that we can do and always sort of emphasize when the medical students and um, when we first started in the hospital was, you know, the importance of washing hands and the disinfection of fomites to, to break transmission and potentially, particularly important before any of our procedures. Here it lists some of the, the common fomites just in offices, but also in our surgery, be it the phones. And, you know, as I said, the, the mobile phones are high risk of being colonized by a whole lot of my, microbes and I clean mine down at least sort of twice a day, but as you put it aside and try not to touch it through the day, uh, doorknobs, all the things on our, our table surfaces. And when it comes to medicine, the gloves, as you expect, can be contaminated, masks less so, eye shields less so, but one of the more contaminated places is the top of the alcohol hand rub. So this should be cleaned regularly, but luckily after dispensing, they, people do sort of then hopefully um, disinfect their hands by rubbing it and leaving it on the hands for that 20 seconds. But it's important to emphasize, don't touch your face. And it's very important when removing our PPE, we remove it correctly so we don't contaminate ourselves or other surfaces at the same time. And after removing gloves, it's important to wash your hands because the virus can also get through the gloves sort of slowly and um, vinyl's not as protective as latex or, or nitrile. But key also to remember is that it can survive in the air for up to sort of um, three or four hours. Um, other patient considerations, you know, you've got to presume people are potentially infective and it's in the early phase of disease that they probably are most infective and that one to do day pre-symptomatic period is probably a, a period of greatest risk when people can transmit the disease without knowing that they're unwell. Um, and this is estimated to account for about 44% of disease transmission. The role for asymptomatic carriers is becoming more evident, but we still need to know more. Um, this shows some of the, the key clinic precautions. So um, hand sanitizer on arrival, mentioned the taking of temperature, in Australia, the social distancing stipulated to be 1.5 metres, but it could be anywhere between one and two metres, depending on where you are. Um, for reception, so they don't have to wear masks and that we have perspex screens, all the normal sort of things to keep people entertained, the waiting area, which could be fomites have been removed. We've done everything electronic that we can, be it the consent form, all the referrals, patient profile, um, and we've made sure there's no cash um, we try and do no touch with all payments, but if they do need to use the pet keypad, that's wiped between all patients. And we try not to have patients use or touch their mobile phones while in the clinic. Um, and it's good to see that a lot of things that we're doing, there's more recent sort of support for that with the physical distancing. So there's good evidence, greater than one metre does reduce infections um, and it keeps probably increasing up to two metres um, and it will depend on the interpretation of your regulatory people, what you need to follow. Um, but face masks, are protective by the looks of things, both for healthcare workers and the general public. And now hopefully they're under much better um, supply around the world. Um, with N95 probably being better, but not always practical, but surgical masks do provide good protection. And eye protection, I think it's a good precaution to take, be that eye shields, or glasses, or um, a face shield. Um, but don't forget the hand washing. And I know you all know about the 20 second rule there, making sure it covers all the aspects be it between the fingers, the dorsum of the hands, etc. Um, but then you, you get in the habit of not touching other parts of your face and that, and I've got better and better at that this year. Um, but when it comes to cleaning, disinfecting, it's important to make sure you clean first to remove all the organic metal 
and then disinfect, otherwise you're not going to kill off both our other key previous pathogens and, and COVID-2. Um, um, and I think here it goes through sort of key things um, that we use and alcohol's a nice sort of safe measure. It's good for the skin, especially if you've got some emollients added, but for our equipment, a lot of our energy-based devices, it's a pretty safe sort of one to have, but it's always good to double check with a manufacturer. Um, although bleach is sort of recommended for other sort of surfaces, this isn't recommended for a lot of our equipment um, and can be sort of quite harsh. But fortunately, there's also a list of other commercial products which often combine both a detergent and antiseptic or um, biocide in, in one. And there's lists from the EU and also lists from the FDA. And of course, there's always the benefits of hot water. Um, so the key parts with that, ideally you need to clean surfaces and equipment before disinfecting. But for a lot of the low minimal touch equipment that we have, be it the touch screen with um, sort of our lasers, um, wiping with alcohol may be sufficient between things, but say if you've used a hand piece with sort of gel, any other potential organic matter, it's important to wipe that off and clean that first before, before disinfecting. And again, although bleach is recommended by a lot of authorities for different things, it's not always appropriate for our equipment or surfaces. Um, and when it comes to biocidal agents for the skin prep, so, you know, often those high risk sites are going to be the back of people's hands, their forearms, their head and neck, where they, they may have contaminated skin we might be treating. So it's good to know that our usual things we use, such as um, isopropyl alcohol, are good. Povidone iodine is also a good cleanser, but disinfectant as well, be that 5% or 7.5%. Other options include benzyl, chromium chloride with a, a longer dwell time. And chlorhexidine at a decent concentration also works very well with lower concentrations working more slowly. Um, so as we sort of heard from other areas in medicine, um, aerosol generating procedures can be a high risk and be responsible for sort of super spreading. Um, and although we don't quite have those in dermatology, there's some sort of things which can um, potentially reflect some of those, those risks. So for them, for these sort of high risk aerosol procedures, when you're doing um, intubation of patients who might be infected, you really have to do the whole N95 the um, face shields and protections, the gowns, um, gloves, and the um, negative sort of pressure rooms. Um, but key for us to make sure that masks do fit properly, um, there's lots of things to say that facial hair isn't good for having a good seal. And most of the evidence is for N95s where you should have a mask that's been appropriately fitted for you, the correct size, use the right one that's best for you. But again, Laser masks can be of good value, particularly if there's low risk of COVID in the community and patients you're treating. But again, they need to be properly fitted for them to work well. So if you've got a beard, it's a good time to lose it for the rest of the year. Um, but when it comes to things, a lot of our devices, be it the Actolite we use for PDT, do have fans that could potentially blow the virus ar around. And you know, I put our cryo coolers away in the corner at the moment because they, uh, this virus does like the cold and we, we don't want to be disseminating them there. Um, Cryotherapy that the studies to show that HPV and HSV can survive um, in liquid nitrogen for at least brief periods of time. And that does also lead to um, some potential aerosol generation. So we've, we've got to think, be careful when we're treating things like the lips or around the mouth. And a lot of our devices also have cool spray devices as well. Um, we use nitrous in our, our clinic, but we've stopped using the mask and we just use um, the it demand sort of systems, which are a lot sort of safer when needed. But again, we try not to use this at all if we don't have to. Um, but when it comes to laser plumes and electric electrosurgical plumes, it's just a reminder that there's a bit of controversy, but some studies have tried to suggest that these particles may be associated with both being a vector and increasing risk of severe infection. Um, this, of course, remains to be proven. But you know, our plumes that we use, there have always been safety sort of um, concerns. So it's important that we do incorporate and follow these even more stringently now. The plumes are made by vaporization of tissue. Um, and this is particularly a problem with ablative lasers, be it CO2 or erbium. And these contain a mixture of both toxic gases, which it's good if we can filter out, which have chemical risks, but the larger particles also potentially carry sort of um, infection risks, be it viruses, bacteria or fungi. And of course, there's always the background particular um, health risks such as cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease. 
Um, so electrocautery and lasers, they really produce the same sort of components in the particles produced, um, but there's a bigger spread potentially with the laser plume, so they are potentially more effective than the electrosurgical ones. And this is just detailing other studies from the past that show that bacteria and virus can be potentially spread from these plumes. Um, though of course, further studies always sort of need and we appreciate it. And when it comes to electrosurgery, um, monopolar has a greater um, production of electrosurgical plume than bipolar. So bipolar is good to use where you can. Don't use unnecessarily high energies, um, try and use lower energies and less extensive sort of production of plume if possible. Um, and again, with lasers, the ablative top of the list, but PICO lasers and Q-switch lasers can also have a significant plume and even hair removal. Um, but when it comes to sort of the filtering of these um, key parts, you know, it's very important we do have a mask when we're using ablative laser. Um, the laser masks do sort of filter out the particles very well, but it's their fit around the face that's most important and you don't want to be necessarily sucking them in around the mask. Um, and these are probably still adequate if you've got a good plume scavenging system and a low risk of of sort of COVID in your community at the time. But an N95 mask is always going to be ideal in this situation. And when it comes to the plume scavenging systems, HEPA's okay and most viral particles will be in sort of clusters and it won't be just the individual virus and the HEPA filters will remove most of those. But ideally it should be the ULPA filters which are capable of removing even small smaller particles more efficiently. Um, carbon filter, um, also sort of good for those toxic volatile carbon derivatives. And when it comes to handling these filters, of course, all the right conviction controls should be followed. As you said, they can survive on foam lights be it for hours or days, depending on their nature. Um, unfortunately, in our clinic initially, we didn't put in any HEPA filtering in our air conditioning, but when we do our next laser lab, we definitely will consider putting in line HEPA filtering. But you know, as a good second best, you know, you could consider um, an air purifier in your room. Um, and ones we have have HEPA, carbon filter and air ionisation, which will hopefully help assist sort of reduce the risks and maybe help reduce any aerosols in the room. Um, and this is just sort of showing the difference between HEPA and U+. So the HEPA filters, they're pretty good, but if you've got those individual viral particles, some could get through the HEPA filter and that's been shown for some viruses. Whereas the ULPA, particularly important, and previously that was key when you were treating, say, warts where you didn't want to cause any laryngeal papillomas. Um, so when it comes to eye protection, um, if you're doing ablative laser, pico laser, Q-switch laser, I would sort of like to have a, a face shield um, more than just an eye shield. Whereas so if you're doing sort of non-ablative laser electrosurgery, um, the eye shield may be sort of adequate there, a lot, especially if you're using, say, bipolar instead of monopolar with masks. Again, the N95 is not always practical for different things. So we sort of stick to those for the higher risk sort of ablative lasers. And you know, fortunately we're not in a situation in Australia where we presume most of our patients are infected, but it's quite low at the moment, but that might change if I'm doing surgery that I would probably go back to an N95 if working near the nose and there's a high community risk. Um, we all wear surgical caps just because you know, not everyone's gonna wash their hair every day after being in the clinic. We all have work clothes or work scrubs to wear and any aerosol generating procedures will add on a, on a gown. Um, and the gloves, again, gloves are great to use, but it's a safe removal that's also important, followed by the hand hygiene. And we don't have any vinyl gloves in our, glo in our clinic. We just have the latex and nitrile for the safety precautions. Um, sort of covered with the filter changing that before. So I think the other bit, I mentioned sort of the antiseptics that you should use. Um, and we're very careful with any of our procedures, be it just IPL or um, peels on the face um, and cryotherapy. We will normally um, treat these areas either with sort of some alcohol or one of the other antiseptics we've mentioned before. Um, and when you're doing the electrosurgical treatments, again, be it sort of one of those high risk areas or any risk area, we'll, we'll use a biocide first to cover both other sort of potential pathogens, but COVID as well for our safety. Um, and when it comes to cryotherapy, I think most Australian dermatologists wouldn't pre-clean the, clean the skin, say on the arms, but if you are doing things around the face or nose, a lot of um, my colleagues um, do also sort of potentially clean the skin there. Um, but luckily, as I mentioned before, it's not high risk. So for people not doing this, they're probably not taking particular risk, but if 
COVID was more common in the community, I think before cryotherapy, it's a very reasonable thing to use a biocide. Um, and I was just mentioning there, it's ideal if a patient when they come in can have sort of washed beforehand and then you've just got to do the skin antisepsis. And unfortunately, things like povidon iodine that are both a good cleanser and biocide aren't always nice cosmetically and your Botox patients or filler patients won't always want to leave with a, a tan like Trump afterwards. Um, another sort of potential thing to consider when you're doing sort of um, ablative laser or PDT or things which cause broken skin, um, we don't know at this stage whether broken skin could be another source of transmission if a respiratory droplet landed on, on eroded, broken and compromised skin. But I think, you know, if you are doing a, a more strong um, ablative laser treatment or PDT, it's good to make sure patients know to go home and to go to a controlled environment where their risk of being exposed to COVID is going to be lowered. Um, and when it comes to facial aesthetic injections, um, we sort of, a team of us sort of reviewed what we thought we should for changing the guidelines in Australia to take in the COVID risks. And again, sort of mentioned the importance of doing the, the oh, sorry, the screening questions for risk and vulnerable patients. Um, I think it's also important to try and limit the duration of um, treatment so you, the patients aren't um, in close contact for prolonged periods. So if you can stage the, the procedures and try and limit to 15 and, and less than 30 minutes if you can. Um, some clinics will um, choose not to do perioral facial injections at the moment because of the potential risks. Um, and we've sort of recommend against sort of using non-disposable face masks, um, oh, sorry, um, face markers or the squeeze balls. Um, try and not have the patients hold mirrors because although you try and clean things between, it's good if you try and minimise any potential spread or contamination. Um, skin preparation for botulinum toxin, it's not in its important normally to do the antiseptic, but if you know they can wash with soap and water or cleanser first, this should be adequate. But of course, for any sort of filler, you need to do a proper antisepsis as well, such as alcohol or povidone iodine. And these are probably superior to um, chlorhexidine based on viral studies. Um, but post-procedure, a lot of patients often treat and touch their face after an aesthetic um, procedure. It's important to remind them to wash their hands first. And you know, if they're doing something like polylactic acid where they're meant to massage their face five times a day for five days. Again, just reinforce the need for washing hands and um, making sure that the area they do is, um, is being sort of cleaned and, and decontaminated. And when it comes to these procedures, at least for Australia and New Zealand, you know, if there was a high rate of community transmission, they probably shouldn't be sort of done. So at this stage, we presume there's a low rate of community transmission where we're doing these procedures. And we think sort of this eye protection, a normal surgical mask and gloves should be adequate. Um, and as you said, our recommendation would be not to, I mean, to be using more PPE and we shouldn't be doing these procedures with a high rate of community transmission. Um, when it comes to our devices, um, again, it's sort of make sure you just have one use sort of things and not shared elastic straps or only use things that can be sort of cleaned and disinfectant between patients. We'll usually get them to hair covers or a disposable cap. Eye shields eventually mainly use disposable, but where we can't, we'll clean with soap or detergent or disinfectant, but of course not chlorhexidine around the eyes, which can be a, a corneal irritant. Um, and again, anything that would need intraocular eye shields would try and defer at the moment. You know, with the gel, use a squeeze to dispense. Don't use a, a pat spatula that could be double dipped or anything like that. Um, and again, we've taken all the hand mirrors out of the rooms and all the squeeze balls. And I think it's important, yeah, just make sure we do disinfect everything between the patients as well and any contaminated service to clean and then disinfect. So just sort of starting to come towards the end there. Um, for different sort of areas of medicine, they've had the hierarchies of different things you can do. Um, but the, the key things we can do are sort of um, choose the right sort of patients where things aren't sort of necessary or an, are unnecessary risk, uh, eliminate them, such as the need for a cryo cooler. Um, always make sure you disinfect and clean what you can if you are going to cause any aerosol or um, potential laser plumes. Um, the air treatment, I think, is sort of key and really going from this, we probably will have much cleaner air in our clinics and, and better lungs after COVID. Um, but I think you know, with PPE, it's 
important to use the right levels there. But in Australia, although we do have more supplies, we don't have excess supplies of N95 masks and they're still locked away in, in cupboards and only used where appropriate. Um, with your staff, make sure you're not taking risks. And if you've got older staff who are at high risk, you know, maybe they should have less patient contact and have other duties until things slow down a bit more in regard to potential risks. Um, and again, when it comes to the procedures we do, you know, if, if a patient's thinking of ablative treatment, maybe you could defer it and do some IPL or something a bit safer at the moment and plan when the risk of COVID has gone down. So, you know, maybe aim to guide people to less risky procedures that are quicker to do um, and potentially safer for both your staff and the patient. I think I'll sort of round things up to make sure we've got plenty of time for our, our next very good speaker and discussion. So, as you said, keep in touch with your um, regulatory requirements where you are. Um, always consider the transmission risks of anything that you're doing, which could have a laser plume. Um, I think you know, be consistent in screening all your patients before they arrive and then they arrive arrival and, and don't get snack, slack over the next three to six months. Um, and I've hopefully overly covered the bit about cleaning and disinfecting. So I want to say thank you very much for having me involved in this, this evening's presentation. Thank you very much, John. That was an excellent lecture and uh, very informative. But we have not got any question yet at the moment, and we will leave the question and answers towards the end of the session. I'm sure there'll be some questions. I've got some questions to ask you anyway, and uh, so we'll wait till the end. We have Hui Chen here now. Are you there, Hui Chen? You got to turn on your mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. So Hui Chen is going to talk to us about the management and uh, preventions of uh, dermatosis arising from the use of PPE. As you know, that we are all using PPE now, either in the form of a mask, gown, shield, and all sorts of things. Eh? And uh, with use, we, we are actually, uh, a lot of patients who are uh, using them develop reactions to them. And uh, we, are, we are finding ways of how to prevent them for example, even in my own experience, because I've been washing my hands so often, I, I think I'm going to develop hand eczema very soon. I just feel my hands very dry. So we Chen will tell us what to do and uh, share her experience with us. We Chen is from KK Hospital. She's a consultant a dermatologist in the Children and um, uh, Women's Hospital. We Chen, please. Thank you, Prof. Go. So let me just share my screen first. Okay, so I'll start. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the talk today. And I will be talking about prevention and management of PPE-related dermatosis in healthcare workers during this pandemic. So just a quick disclaimer before I carry on, I have no financial disclosures or any conflicts of interest to declare, and I have no affiliation to any of the products that I'll be showing in this presentation. And finally, I have a lot of clinical photos in this presentation, and these were provided by um, fellow healthcare workers who are working on the front line. So in order to respect their privacy, please kindly refrain from taking their photos. Okay, I'm sure we know by now, as we've mentioned earlier, about how COVID-19 has actually been the virus that blanketed the whole, has blanketed the whole world by now. And even in Singapore, uh, in the recent months, uh, we were hit really hard. By the, COVID, uh, by the COVID virus because uh, in March 2020, there were multiple clusters found in uh, foreign worker dormitories. So uh, in the past few months, all our healthcare workers have, de have been deployed all over the island uh, to environments beyond the hospital that includes the worker dormitories, the outdoor screening centers and community isolation facilities. So we know that as healthcare workers, as mentioned earlier, we are at a very high risk of catching COVID-19 and we need to protect ourselves as well. So this is the standard PPE against COVID-19, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And um, this is a photo of myself wearing it in an air conditioned ward. I was wearing it for about maybe about 45 minutes and uh, I soon developed indentations on my face as well as urticaria on my body because of the sweat. And this was even in an air conditioned uh, ward in the hospital. So I was very happy and re relieved to remove it 45 minutes later. But our other colleagues who are working in say the emergency department or the dormitories who are doing screening for many, many hours during a shift, 
they have to wear this continuously for more than six hours at, during their shift. And this is also known even on the newspapers, they have been talking about how medical staff are wearing the PPE continuously for seven to 10 hours. And this is not good, which we'll talk about later. So adverse skin reactions to PPE in healthcare workers on the front line is not new to us. In fact, Prof Go reported this in Singapore during our SARS experience. And uh, at that time, we surveyed more than 300 patient, uh, healthcare workers, sorry. And uh, more than 30% of them uh, reported acne, facial itch and rashes from the N95 masks. And more than 20% of those who were using gloves actually reported dryness of the skin, itch and rashes. So we concluded that the use of PPE was associated with high rates of adverse skin reactions in frontline healthcare workers during this outbreak. And while SARS started in February 2003, fortunately was contained in May 2003. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still very much at large today. And all over the world, there has been an increasing incidence of skin injuries caused by PPE in frontline healthcare workers. So this is actually a new problem that we need to recognize. So in China, uh, one of the larger studies, they reviewed uh, nine, uh, 542 healthcare workers and 97% of them actually self-reported skin damage. The most common site was the nasal bridge followed by the hands, the cheeks and the forehead and dryness and tightness was actually the most common symptom. What was even more interesting is that the healthcare workers who were wearing medical devices for more than six hours, such as goggles and N95 masks, had a higher, significantly higher risk of skin damage in the corresponding sites on the face. Those who wore a face shield instead for the same duration of time did not suffer from any uh, higher risk of getting forehead skin damage. So this is something that is important to note. So in the event that you're getting a lot of symptoms from wearing the goggles as a healthcare worker, if a face shield is available, you might want to con uh, consider this as an alternative. So why do we need to prevent and treat these occupational skin diseases? For a few reasons. I think amongst us, we know even for ourselves, we have anecdotally chosen to ignore some of these very mild symptoms that we face, like, like maybe some indentations or itch from the sweating. And we, have, we just want to get the day over and done with. So we, and the shift, we just want to, we can't wait for it to be over. But we should not ignore these symptoms, especially if you're going to be wearing the PPE every day as a frontline healthcare worker. Why? The first thing is, of course, if we prevent these, we improve the quality of life of our staff. We also boost staff morale. And in doing so, we improve the compliance rates to PPE. The other thing is, if you have itch or say any abrasions or erosions on the face or other parts of the body that's covered by the PPE, then you will inadvertently try to adjust your goggles or your mask or you end up touching your face. And that puts you at risk of virus transmi viral transmission. And so, we need to prevent and recognize these occupational skin diseases to prevent any um, accidental use, uh, or failure of PPE or breach of PPE protocol due to the symptoms or discomfort. And this is important because several years ago, it was actually reported that two healthcare workers were infected with Ebola virus because of this reason. Now, the first condition I'll talk about is hand dermatitis, which as Prof Go mentioned, is very common amongst us, and not just us, but also the general population. So in fact, it has been reported that overzealous hand hygiene during this COVID-19 pandemic is causing a high incidence of hand eczema amongst the general population. And these are just some photos of a physician who was working in the emergency department in Singapore who developed irritant contact dermatitis of the hands. She was washing her hands with soap and water more than 10 times in a shift like you and I. And she did not apply her moisturizers after and two weeks later it ended up like that. So in another study, more than 80% of healthcare workers reported the hands as the most commonly affected site during this pandemic. And as mentioned, majority washed their hands more than 10 times in a day but only 20% of them apply emollients after washing. So we know that with frequent hand washing with soap and water, without applying any emollients after that to facilitate skin barrier repair, will result in cumulative insult or injury to the skin barrier. And eventually, you end up with chronic inflammation and uh, hand eczema. So what are some of the factors that cause irritant contact dermatitis in a healthcare worker? Well, the first thing, of course, would be frequent hand washing or wet work. The second thing would be the antiseptic cleansers and the defecting uh, 
chemicals or soaps. And of course, especially in a climate like Singapore, the heat and the sweating that accumulates under the occlusive gloves makes this worse. And even the powder and medical gloves also can cause irritation. So the cumulative damage to the skin barrier will not only predispose you to irritant contact dermatitis, but also will predispose a healthcare worker to secondary infections and allergic contact dermatitis to the materials in the gloves, which I'll talk about later. So any breach of the skin, as we talked about earlier, may potentially put you at risk also of viral transmission. Now, in terms of management, as we talked about earlier, the CDC has actually recommended that alcohol-based hand rubs that contain anything greater than 60% ethanol or 70% isopropanol are ideal in healthcare settings for us. Um, and in fact, we will recommend this as the first line uh, for uh, hand hygiene unless the hands are visibly soiled. Not only are these more convenient, they also improve the compliance rates, they are more tolerable on the skin, and they are known to cause less skin damage. So this will be a safer option. And gels, in general, are more tolerated than the liquid formulation. And even after you apply your moisturizers, it, will not, it is not known uh, to affect the efficacy of these alcohol-based hand rubs. The other thing is when we are washing our hands, we should avoid using hot water because as we know, the heat will damage or disrupt the skin barrier. And we should also use gentle pH balanced soap-free cleansers where possible. And whenever we can, we should moisturize and moisturize and moisturize. Not just with any kind of moisturizer, but something that will repair the skin barrier. Something that contains lipids or ceramides. So when should a healthcare worker seek advice? Really when the eczema is severe enough, uh, when there's severe inflammation, when there's pain, swelling, fissures or oozing, such that they are unable to work, then it is time to perhaps take a break. You need not only to give them topical steroids to reduce the inflammation or sometimes even a short course of uh, oral corticosteroids depending on the condition, but more importantly, the skin will need time to heal and so rostering changes may be needed. So, as I talked about earlier, medical gloves can also cause irritant contact dermatitis. But in some papers and studies, they have reported that wearing double layers of gloves reduces the risk of viral contamination when you doff or remove the gloves. And therefore, in China, uh, more than 10% of the healthcare workers actually reported wearing three layers of gloves to protect themselves. Now, I don't recommend this, especially given the prolonged usage as, or if you're wearing the gloves for many hours in shift and also given the climate, especially like in Singapore, the heat and the humidity will promote excess moisture accumulation on the hands underneath the gloves and exacerbate the occlusion effects. And uh, this will result in moisture associated skin damage and eventually the skin becomes vulnerable to injury and you're more prone to getting contact dermatitis from the materials in the gloves. So I think one layer is enough for skin protection. Of course, in special circumstances, such as if there is a potential breach in hand PPE, or you have significant skin damage as shown in the photos or torn gloves, then you can consider an additional layer. But this should not be something that you do at every shift by like wearing three layers because it will put you at risk of more skin reactions in the long run. So less commonly, um, allergic contact dermatitis can also occur. And this is usually due to the rubber chemicals in the medical gloves. And it's a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, and uh, usually caused by things like diuram or the carbamates. And this is actually the most common cause of occupational allergic hand dermatitis in healthcare workers. And the gold standard is, of course, a patch test. And... Unfortunately, we know that patch tests are actually quite inconvenient, especially during this pandemic. They may not be that feasible or accessible. So just to share with you, during the SARS experience, some of our healthcare workers really had no time to seek medical consults. And so they used temporizing measures such as changing to latex-free gloves or using powder-free gloves or wearing plastic or cotton gloves beneath the latex gloves to protect their skin. But just bear in mind that these are just temporary measures which can be adopted until a formal review with one of us or an occupational health clinic is available. Now, the other problem is also true latex allergy. It is a type 1 immediate hypersensitivity reaction, and this is due to the natural rubber latex proteins in the medical gloves. And uh, the symptoms range from contact urticaria to even life, 
life-threatening anaphylaxis. And the gold standard for this is a skin prick test that should be conducted in a medical setting, supervised by medical personnel and uh, latex-free uh, resuscitative uh, tools. Uh, moving on to facial protection devices, these are some of the common uh, conditions that uh, uh, healthcare workers may face, including skin and indentations and pressure injuries that even I experienced, uh, acne, eczema or contact dermatitis, and contact urticaria. So skin indentations and pressure injuries are talked about a lot now, on, especially in social, on social media. Um, a lot of healthcare workers are putting up selfies of themselves, developing pressure injuries, even after a few hours of wearing N95 masks or the goggles. And the common size of pressure, as we know, are the nasal bridge and the cheeks. And I just should put this photo up uh, just to show that some of them actually have reported pigmentation also. And we find that a lot of this is probably due to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or less commonly pigmented contact dermatitis. And this is a photo of one of my colleagues who was posted to an outdoor screening center and he developed a painful superficial erosion on the nasal bridge after wearing the N95 mask for more than eight hours every day after two weeks. And fortunately, he was deployed out of the outdoors, uh, the screening center after he came to see us. So many of us uh, report skin indentations and mild iridema after one or two hours of wearing the facial protection devices. Now, if it's once or twice, you know it's reversible and it can be treated and it will correct itself. But we shouldn't ignore this, especially if we're doing this every single day. So if you're working on the front line, then the constant pressure to the same sites, on the same areas, will eventually progress to pressure injuries, such as blisters, erosions, and ulcers. And furthermore, if you're working in a very humid and hot environment, just like in Singapore, then the hyperhydration effect will result in excess moisture accumulation under the areas covered by the gloves or the mask. And this will result in moisture-associated skin damage, and it can also lead to microabrasions with secondary infections. So what should we do to prevent this? The first thing, of course, is to prepare the skin. So we cleanse the skin with uh, a gentle uh, pH balanced skin cleanser and pat dry. And then after that, you can apply uh, liquid skin sealant or skin protection uh, protectants around the potential areas of pressure or friction uh, on the face. And it is very, very important to do this at least 30 minutes to one hour before donning the PPE. And you need to gently rub the product into the skin to ensure it's dry before you put on the PPE. Otherwise, it will cause slippage of the mask or the goggles. The second thing is to minimize the duration of pressure. It is important to take frequent breaks in non-contaminated areas every two to three hours for about 10 to 15 minutes. So whenever you can, try to relieve the pressure of the mask of the face, of course, and to take a break in a non-contaminated, well-ventilated area. And of course, in the event of severe pressure injuries, then depending on how it is, if it's exudative or non-exudative, you may need wound dressings depending on the wound type. And sometimes for secondary infections, we may need to prescribe topical antibiotics. Some simple do's and don'ts for facial protection devices. So do moisturize the skin regularly, especially when not at work to protect the skin barrier and apply at least one hour before wearing the mask again because you don't want to enhance any slippage if it has not fully absorbed. Um, the other thing is to consider switching to a face shield or a visor if the goggles are causing significant pressure injuries. Thirdly, a lot of healthcare workers have been anecdotally trying to stack layers of dressings underneath the mask or the goggles. Now, I do not recommend this again because you might compromise the integrity of the mask fit. And also, if you put it all and stack it in one area, you may actually conversely increase the pressure on the skin and make things worse. And finally, do not use any oils or petroleum-based ointments as this will enhance the slippage of the mask and put you at risk. So this is an example of one of my colleagues, again, who was in another uh, screening facility in the outdoors, and he developed skin indentations on the cheeks as well as the nasal bridge. So he was using a commercially available hydrochloride dressing on the nasal bridge to hopefully improve his symptoms. Now, it is important to note that there is no evidence to prove that any of these prophylactic dressings will protect the wearer's safety from COVID-19. We are not sure if it may compromise the integrity of the mask fit. So where possible, do a self-seal check or get mask fitting if it is if feasible. 
And if you really do need to use a prophylactic dressing, then I would recommend using the thinnest available, such as Duodum Extra Thin. The other condition I'll talk about is N95 acne, which was first reported by us in the SARS experience as well. This is a case report of a healthcare worker who developed acne on a face after wearing N95 mask during the SARS period. So these are just some real life examples of healthcare workers who also developed acne after wearing the goggles and also uh, over the areas covered by the N95 mask on the cheeks. So why does this happen? Again, because of constant friction and pressure from the goggles as well as the masks, this will cause occlusion of the pilosebaceous ducts and it will also worsen pre-existing inflammatory acne papules. And those who have non-acne prone skin can also develop what is called acne mechanica uh, from rupture of the invisible microcomedones. And uh, if, again, you are working in a high temperature and a high humidity, uh, place with high humidity, then the excess moisture and sweat accumulation underneath the goggles and the mask is not good and will also increase sebum production and also cause proliferation of bacteria, which will also put one at risk of acne. In terms of management, of course, is to take regular breaks from the facial protective devices as much as possible and to use facial cleansers that will have oil controlling properties such as benzoyl peroxide or salicylic acid and uh, you can use topical antibiotics for spot treatment to the acne papules and if it's very oily consider using topical retinoids judiciously at night on the face and when needed um, use oil-free non-comedogenic moisturizers and of course for some severe or recalcitrant cases then you may want to see us we may have to give a short course of oral antibiotics now the masks, the goggles, and the straps can also cause irritant contact dermatitis on the face and corresponding sites. And occasionally, allergic contact dermatitis can also occur. And this is usually due to the adhesives, the metal clips, or the rubber straps. And in fact, two healthcare workers were reported to have allergic contact dermatitis to the textile, the non-woven fabric in the N95 masks during the SARS period. And this is another example of a healthcare worker in a case report who developed um, allergic contact dermatitis to thiurem that was present in a mask strap as well as a surgical cap lining. And more recently in COVID-19, uh, a healthcare worker in China developed allergic contact dermatitis to the sponge, the polyurethane that was present in the N95 mask on the nasal bridge. So in terms of management, uh, of course, topical steroids can be applied to areas of inflammation. We need to use regular emollients and skin protections as much as possible. And as mentioned earlier, all topicals should be applied at least one hour before donning the PPE to ensure that it is dry and fully absorbed. And if we suspect allergic contact dermatitis, we need to send the healthcare worker for a patch test. Another condition is contact urticaria that can be caused because of the constant pressure from the goggles and the uh, mask linings. So again, uh, one thing we can do to mitigate this is to take regular breaks to relieve the pressure. And if this is a constant problem, then I suggest taking non-sedating antihistamines at least one to two hours prophylactically before the shift. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about environmental factors affecting the skin. Um, so, as you know, Singapore is a very, very hot and humid country. Uh, we, are a tropic, we are in the tropical climate throughout the year and perennially the, temper the daytime temperature is more than 30 degrees Celsius and our mean annual relative humidity is more than 80% throughout the year. So because of this, our healthcare workers on the front line are suffering from a lot of problems and that includes sweating. So this is an example of a healthcare worker who's fully drenched even though he's working in a sort of air-conditioned screening center, um, but he's wearing a layer of scrubs as well as a disposable gown. And after all that hard work, after eight hours, he's fully drenched in sweat. And this causes irritation on the skin. Furthermore, humidity, sun exposure, heat and dust are all these environmental factors that can aggravate various skin conditions, especially here in Singapore. So uh, inflammatory skin conditions include eczema, psoriasis, and again, the hyperhydration effect, the constant sweating can, or, or the accumulation of sweat on the body can result in moisture associated skin damage and result in macerations, erosions, and irritant contact dermatitis to the materials in the PPE. 
And uh, we are also subjected to a lot of heat-related conditions here in our climate, and that includes heat injuries, cholinergic urticaria, malaria, and superficial fungal infections. So this is an example of a healthcare worker in the emergency department who developed um, uh, irritant contact dermatitis on the neck, and this was exacerbated by the friction from the disposable gown hauler as well as sweating in the outdoor screening center. And another example of another healthcare worker who developed a flare of her seboric uh, dermatitis on her scalp because it was constantly, uh, she was constantly sweating underneath the surgical cap. Another healthcare worker who developed intertrigoal in the toe web spaces and tried to self-medicate, but eventually she had to see us because her symptoms were really quite severe. Uh, some healthcare workers also develop cholinergic urticaria, like myself. And very rarely, if you exert yourself, you may also develop exercise-induced anaphylaxis. So again, I think uh, other than trying to keep cool and take regular breaks, you may consider taking non-sedating oral antihistamines before the shift. And malaria is also very common in Singapore. So the treatment is really to keep cool, remove the sweat-soaked uh, garments as soon as possible after the shift, and avoid any tight or restrictive clothing underneath your disposable gown, and stay in cool, non-contaminated, well-ventilated areas where possible. Tinea versicola is also very common in Singapore, and uh, especially with the sweating. And uh, so the treatment is to keep cool and apply antifungal creams. So less commonly, uh, allergic contact dermatitis from even the surgical gowns and the disposable gowns can actually occur. And this is a case report of a pediatrician who developed allergic contact dermatitis to the non-woven fabric in the disposable gowns and the N95 mask during the SARS experience. So it's just something to look out for or consider. And uh, other countries have also been complaining about the heat during this pandemic and in Russia, this made the headlines because one nurse decided to wear a bikini to work because it was just too hot. Of course, I'm not going to suggest that. So this is, these are some other measures that I will suggest. So firstly, take frequent breaks and hydrate regularly and uh, avoid wearing the PPE for continuously for more than six hours to prevent the accumulation of sweat on the skin. And wear moisture wicking fabrics or garments underneath the disposable gowns to try and keep cool as possible. And when taking breaks, it should be done in a well-ventilated, non-contaminated area with adequate cooling devices. And of course, we need to use soap-free cleansers and to moisturize after showering. And whenever you're not on shift, apply the moisturizers as frequently as possible. For inflammation, use topical steroids again and take antihistamines when needed for other carrier or any intractable itch. And if we suspect textile ACD, a uh, patch test, it may be necessary. So this is another example of a group of Chinese female healthcare workers who decided to shave their heads bald because it was just more convenient during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone goes to shave their head bald, but uh, at least it might be worth considering keeping it trim and short. And uh, because this facilitates adequate protection with the surgical cap and also allows easy washing and decontamination. And it also reduces the chance of moisture and sweat accumulation under the surgical caps. Now, if you really do want to keep your hair long, then it is important to bun it up in a hairnet very tightly and wear the surgical cap on top of it and wash thoroughly after the shift. So moving on from scalp hair to facial hair, if you have very, very thick facial hair, for the men especially, you know, this may actually alter or compromise the fit of the mask. And uh, it can also promote moisture accumulation under the mask on the skin, and it makes one more prone to acne, folliculitis, as well as irritant contact dermatitis. So for this reason, if you are working hard on the, in the front line, I recommend that healthcare workers get regular shaving and cleansing. Now, this is my last slide. There's also a summary slide. So in summary, PPE-related skin reactions should not be neglected. And uh, tropical climates may make us more susceptible to certain skin conditions. So if we are making any guidelines or giving any advice to our healthcare workers, we need to also bear in mind or take into consideration the environment or where they have been deployed to. 
And lastly, preventative measures can be taken and for severe cases, they should seek medical attention. We should make ourselves available as dermatologists to the healthcare workers uh, in the form of physical consultations, if not email or teledermatology. And more importantly, it is important to try not to exceed wearing PPE continuously for more than six hours and to take regular breaks every two to three hours to hydrate and mitigate the risk of skin reactions. So thank you very much for your attention. This is my email address if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Huijian. That was a very comprehensive and clear presentation. Uh, we learned a lot from you. And kudos must go to all those workers in the front line who have to sacrifice all, you know, suffers a lot of discomfort and suffer quietly and yet doesn't complain at all. In fact, I hardly hear anybody complaining of their side effects from all the PBEs. But I think we should take note of that and uh, give them any help that they may need to uh, that they encounter. So now we go on to the Q&A session. Uh, we have only two questions so far, but can the attendees su uh, sub submit your question, then I can put forward to you. So we'll go on to Q&A, right? So the first question was from uh, Bahrain, Dr. Anil Kumar. We are avoiding laser procedures and aesthetic ones for now till it becomes safe. So uh, I think John can answer this question. When is when do you consider safe to perform aesthetic procedure? I think this is the problems that we have all the time. During the, 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 uh, the uh, early period, uh, it was very straightforward that no aesthetic procedure. There's a lack of manpower and that we have to re re redistribute our resources. Uh, but somewhere in between now, we have a problem. So maybe you can give your comment, John. Yes, thank you very much. And yeah, Dr. Lee, that was an excellent presentation. So I definitely learned a bit, but um, I think it's a hard question because it does vary very much country to country and you know, in Australia we've got sort of a few guiding sort of principles we've got to make sure we're following the medical legal requirements of our insurers but also our government was really sort of quite specific in stipulating what we couldn't and could do at the beginning and I think when we talk between our colleagues and and when sort of things were beginning to unwind we've been really sort of quite lucky in Australia and New Zealand that in New Zealand they really haven't had any community uh, acquired infections for a long time and in lots of Australia like New Zealand um, Tasmania they've had no community acquired infections for about 38 days Queensland similarly ACT WA whereas in New South Wales it's been mainly sort of new people coming in from overseas um, but in Victoria we still have community acquired family hotspots so it's a lot of uh, Australia we're now allowed to do cosmetic procedures um, and there are actually no restrictions on us now from our insurers or from the government. But I, I think it's one of those things where we're still a bit more cautious. As he said, I'm, I haven't done any sort of lips. We've tried to discourage all our, our bot botulinum toxin patients, but they, you know, they've started so, sort of coming back. Um, but I think, again, we've been avoiding sort of bigger ablative procedures. I've been avoiding the cryotherapy. I think it's sort of, in Australia, it's, it's a patient to patient sort of thing and a, and a doctor thing but I think you know, if I was in a country where there is significant community spread I wouldn't be sort of doing um, any cosmetic procedures but now we're mainly doing physical therapies for acne, acne scarring or for PDT for sort of skin cancers um, but as I said if they're going to do cosmetic procedures we're doing sort of lower risk ones such as botulinum toxin, IPL or sort of vascular laser but again the pressures are now mounting to do things like CO2 and ablative lasers and I, I think very soon we'll be sort of be doing them in our clinic too, especially if the community um, transmission hasn't, isn't occurring and there's not a second wave. But I think I'll be sort of keen to know in Singapore how, how your sort of practice is doing it. But as I said before, we were told not to use PPE to keep it for the first line workers, but now that's no longer an issue. And in our private and public hospitals um, from the 1st of July, all elective surgery can go ahead as well. Okay, so it depends basically also on the resources that's available because in Singapore, for example, a lot of our supporting staff were actually deployed to dorms, to other places, and then the hospital was quite, de were quite depleted. So they also, it also depends on the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the prevalence of the disease, the patient in, uh, amongst the patient, and especially with patients who are asymptomatic, we can't identify them. Uh, whether they will uh, transmit the disease. But so that, let me ask you a question on that. 
related to that. Do you think there's a place where high risk procedures are being planned that patients should have a pre-operative swap done to ensure that they are negative before the procedure is carried out? I'm talking about high risk procedure like treating in the oral mucosal area. Is there a rule? And I'd have to say, yes, there would be, especially if there's any community spread. And in our hospital system before any sort of ENT things, you know, be routine to do the, the swab the day before and, and make sure it's sort of processed quickly. Um, but I haven't heard of any dermatologists doing that at the moment. And the good part now, anyone can have a test done in Australia. They don't have to have any symptoms and it usually just takes a day or two to come back. So I think if you're doing a bigger ablative procedure, something around the nose or lips, I think it'd be very reasonable to ask um, people to, to do. Yeah, because now they can get the results within two or three hours. Uh, after the swap. The only problem is the cost. It costs about, seeing about $200 to do a swap test, you see. So it's pretty expensive for the patient. Okay, let's go on to the other question. It's also directed at you. What to do if the clinic has got no well-ventilated system? This is a question from Amara. It says, so if my clinic doesn't have a well-ventilated system, then uh, what should I do? And I think... Um, just having sort of fresh air, air going through the, the clinic is sort of good and that, that can be beneficial. Um, it's very hard to retrofit an air conditioning system, but I, I think if you are doing things where you have got sort of cryo, potentially sort of any cryo spray, be it minimal or an ablative laser, I probably would look at one of those sort of air purifiers, air filters, and you know I would be quite happy with a HEPA filter as a good sort of compromise. Um, and a lot of those come with carbon filters, but I think if you are doing ablative procedures, I think it probably is very reasonable now to consider um, investing in an air purifier, but you know, just opening the windows if the climate was right, increasing the, the flow foot of air would be appropriate. But I think, yeah, I think when people are setting up clinics now, it's gonna change what we do. So it's actually, it's good to do the procedure under the tree <laughs> in the <laughs> open air. <laughs> okay, another question is when treating patients in a derma clean, is it okay to use half of the PPE? In other words, you are not completely fully gown, you know. Is it safe? And I think that would depend again on the prevalence in, in the community because um, we, we did a, a little um, survey of people from around the world and, you know, for a lot of the American dermatologists, they basically, their answer for doing anything was to be where the most PPE you had available, the highest level. So they'd be doing the N95, the face shield, the gown and everything if, if they had all that, that equipment there. Um, but I think, you know, for a low prevalence sort of place, I think, you know, just having a, a normal surgical mask, um, be it a level one or preferably level or two would probably be adequate. And as he said, I, I think sort of a face shield isn't ideal when you're doing um, patient examinations. It's a bit awkward. It makes things a bit harder. So if, if it is a low prevalence, you know, an eye shield or even just good wraparound glasses, that would be a good mm. compromise. But, you know, if there is significant community um, sort of um, infection, we've all got to sort of think of your own risk factors, how old you are, what other comorbidities. And I think, as you said, there'd have to be some personal choice. But you know, for me, when I've got older patients, my key things, I'm wearing a mask to try and protect them just in case I'm in that asymptomatic period. Yeah. Okay, Hui Chen, can I ask you this question? Um, do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with the N95 mask? Uh, is it a, a disposable mask? In other words, you just use once and then throw it away? Or can you reduce it? Or can you clean it even better? Uh, and how many times can you clean them actually? So this fact, actually I always quite... wonder, even, even our normal surgical mask, how often do we change them? Yeah, so I think there are no fixed guidelines on this right now. In fact, it's controversial because technically these were manufactured to be disposable because once you remove them, you are presuming that whatever you touch also may potentially have respiratory droplets and if you put it back on again, you may potentially subject yourself to the virus. But because of the COVID pandemic and the shortage of PPE recently, they have actually been trying to use various methods to reuse the mask. And so what they've been talking about is using like uh, ultraviolet irradiation to try and uh, disinfect the mask and reuse it again. But um, the guidelines that CDC recommends now is that uh, if you should only reuse the N95 mask if there's a definite shortage in PPE. 
because and it is quite dangerous. Mask? Huh? And if you what and if you surgical, do, yeah, surgical mask. Oh yeah, so surgical masks, right? I mean, this is not really evidence-based, but the ID physicians, the infectious disease physicians, recommend that you use it until it is really, if, if, it's, if the shape is distorted and if the, uh, if the material itself is sort of drenched or moist already, right, you should throw it away. I see. Okay, yeah, John, but you have any comment about that? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, as you said, Early on, that was an issue, and I think people were actually sort of heating them to a certain temperature. And there were some yeah. uh, things sort of going around our DME group in Australia saying how long, what temperature to, to do it with. But I think, as you said, luckily now the surgical masks aren't an issue, but the N95, they're still sort of a, a bit limited supply. So here in Australia, we're discouraged from using those unless you've got a, a COVID patient or you are doing an aerosol procedure and again all the guidelines from the hospital here everything's designed for one use only um, and uh, unfortunately I think you know in your own clinic you can decide to to do different things and another solution is to put the mask aside for seven days and just rotate through them and luckily we don't have the same humidity in in our part of the country than you have there that our masks don't get soggy they just get uh, blood spatter. <laughs> okay they, I think somebody will come up with some device that can sterilize mask uh, very easily. It's some form of a UV light sort of irradiation of some sort. Now, there's a question on teledermatology, but uh, Dr. Anil again says that we should have a worldwide guideline for teledermatology for post covid time. But we already have got teledermatology actually at the moment. The question is that when do we select uh, Patients for teledermatology, first time consultations, are you allowed to do so or is it safe enough? Is it accurate enough? What do you think will happen to dermatology and teledermatology? Will it form a big component of our consultation uh, post COVID or during COVID time? John, if you want to ask, ask, answer the question, too. And I think, as you said, there probably was a bit of resistance to teledermatology by a lot of practitioners before just was something we hadn't set up, we weren't sort of used to. Mm -hmm. And I think it's now that we're doing a lot more, it probably will continue. And yeah, one area I think it has been really useful is sort of in the nursing home. It's, it's nice with those, those vulnerable patients where it's a logistic thing, they need to bring other people there. And at first I thought, oh, it wouldn't be a very practical thing, but the nursing staff in our, our nursing homes are being very good at sort of taking the photos and often it's good to do a combination of photographs and the video um, telehealth. But I think it is very hard for initial consult. I think for reviewing your biologic patients with psoriasis or eczema and things like that, I think it's a very good thing to do. But for us, about 60% of our work is sort of skin cancer and um, the images and teaching patients to take the right photos, that's gonna be the big issue. So I think for us, you know, 40% of our dermatology patients that might be relevant or following up wounds or complications, you know, an acne review, getting the send in photos. But I think yeah, the good part, I think where we need it will now be comfortable to do it. But I think, yeah, for, for certain areas, it probably won't change. So skin cancer, I still like to see it and have my dermatoscope, yes. I must admit. Anyway, you need a biopsy sometimes to confirm the diagnosis. So again, it doesn't mean. Vijayan, you got anything, anything to comment about teledermatology? <clears throat> No, I think Can in our experience, yeah, in the hospital, we're doing it now, but uh, usually for first consultations, we don't recommend it because it's very hard to look at the morphology and it also depends on the, uh, the, the nature of the photographs or the videos, the quality. Mm. So yeah. I, I think it may be a little bit dangerous to try and make a first diagnosis just based on a teledum consultation for first visit. And I, and I think yeah. it can be a good useful triage though. Sometimes that photo will tell you how quickly you've got to see that patient in hospital though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. So I, I think there's a role to play, but I think the caveat is that it's not 100% accurate and therefore they, you must make provision for patients to have a face-to-face -face consultation when you are not sure. See? But then it helps uh, in sort of reducing the need to go to the hospital, especially to the older patients and those in the homes, you know. Now, there's a question here, maybe Dr. D will answer to, how do you clean N95 masks or surgical masks? Can you clean them? 
quite frankly, I don't know. So, but I think, like I said, they've been trying to disinfect them. I mean, based on the CDC uh, guidelines, they've been trying to disinfect them with UV light or using vaporized hydrogen peroxide. But otherwise, there's no other scientific evidence of how you can clean it and make it non-infectious. So I really... You see, because the, the problem is that sometimes you use the mask for a very short duration only, and the mask still looks very brand new clean. So you feel it's a pity to throw them away. And so you just put them aside and then you reuse it again. And I think a lot of people do that, you know. Yeah, I and, mean, and, and anecdotally, yeah. what we do at work is we put it in a sealable Ziploc bag. Mm. And then several hours, we wear it again, if it's really so unused. Well, I think I did read, too. but yeah. I read it's actually good to let the air in circulation, putting in a plastic <laughs> bag actually might make the virus last for longer. You oh no! It becomes, it becomes <laughs> so a I think you know, saying to leave it, leave it, leave it in the in an open place is much better than in a cupboard or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. There is a question on. Uh, thank you for a very good, important lectures. So thank you, thanks to the two speakers. And there's a question from Dr. Nancy Garcia Tan. We all hope that this kind of health problem does not happen again. I don't think you can prevent that though. But as we hopefully learn from the past experience, did the study done in 2003 during SARS help prepare us better for this current time, preventing adverse skin reactions related to PPE in terms of material use for PPE or advice on our healthcare workers? So what do you think, Huijian? Do you think the experience in 2003 sort of prepared us better this time around with the <coughs> epidemics? Yeah, I think What's so because, because firstly the paper was written by you and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after uh, that I think there was an advisory on like uh, some other uh, things like say you, you concluded in the study that prolonged duration of wearing the PPE continuously will put the healthcare worker at risk. So because of this, at least in the hospitals, they now have regular shifts and they shorten the shift durations. Like even mm. in the outdoor screening centers, the shift durations are about four to six hours and they have like one to two hour breaks in non-contaminated areas where possible. So ah, I think it I this. in terms of the public health institutions, which are still within our jurisdiction, but for those mm. outdoor screening centers, like say in the dormitories, the worker dormitories and the new temporary community isolation facilities, those are a little bit different. And that's why we need to reach out to them and try and give them an advisory as well. Yeah, I think we become more conscious of it and we sort of pick them up earlier. And in fact, warning people about the, the possible complication that can arise from that. And then now with, 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 uh, with the understanding of it, I think we can help to reduce the incidence of this uh, uh, problem. So it's good then. And from the logistic point of view, apparently because of the SAR experience, the Asian countries are fairly well prepared in terms of its, its supplies of uh, stocks of gloves, stocks of masks and all that as compared to many other countries actually where they found that they are short. In fact, in Singapore, they were very prevent. They were a bit apprehensive. They thought that it, they are short of it also. And, uh, you know, there was this publicity, just like what John has mentioned in Australia, telling people not to wear masks at all, you know, unless you have got symptoms and all that. I think, I think that's not a, a very clever uh, suggestion because everybody went around spreading the disease. You see? But now they tell everybody to put on the mask and all that. So it is um, something which I think uh, the world will, will be sort of brought down to the next epidemic, then people will remember, okay, by hook and by crew, make sure you stock enough masks and, and put on masks the moment you have it. And that's what Hong Kong and uh, uh, Taiwan did actually. They, from the day one, everybody has to put on masks. Okay, there are some more questions here. I think we have to continue. Please opine the use of PPE during skin biopsy. What is the minimum requirement when you are doing a skin biopsy on the use of PPE? John, you want to answer that first? And I suppose, again, it depends on where you are and the prevalence, but I think, you know, for us in Australia, it's nice to have your own sort of work clothes that you change out of there. Um, in our clinic, we all get people to wear sort of caps and that there, but I think I'd be sort of happy if there's not high prevalence, just to norm wear a normal sort of surgical mask, have sort of a, an eye shield, wash their hands, gloves, and, and their proper disposal. So um, 
for us, it still hasn't been that, that changed that much. And I know there are some older practitioners who will be wearing a face shield for everything and the occasional mm -hmm. person with an N95 mask, but they'd be the exception in Australia. And I think oh. if you've got a high risk patient, a high risk area, it would be different. But I think yeah, it's just, it's been sensible. And as I said, for a dermatology clinic, if you were wearing an N95 and a face shield all day and a gown, that would be extremely hot and uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, Richen, you have any comment? No, not really. If, when we do All the skin right. biopsy, we just wear a surgical mask unless the patient is at risk. Okay. Does SARS-CoV-2 shed through the skin and are skin lesions in COVID contagious? As you know, recently there are quite a number of reports on the cutaneous manifestation of uh, COVID infection. And the question then is that are there viruses on the skin or in this, this skin lesions? Anybody has any answer on that? Regent, you have an answer? No, so we have no evidence at all. Nobody has done a skin biopsy of no. cutaneous lesions of, of, uh, of COVID yet. Surprisingly, no, they, have, they, are... they, have, they have done biopsies, but they usually uh -huh. show secondary changes like vasculitis or, you uh -huh. know, spongiosis or acute inflammation, but there's no way to check if the virus is present in the skin lesion, so they haven't done that. You can't they just That's do a it. PCR of it, crush the tissue and then spread the DNA or RNA and look yeah, for so no one, has done, no one has done that yet in so the literature. We have 8 million people infected with this virus, but mm -hmm. have no idea whether it, they occur on the skin or not. All right. Um, is it safe to use stabilized CO2 uh, I don't understand this question. To use stabilized CIO2 spray on groceries, fruits, etc., as advertised, I we don't understand that question. Okay, is a general dermatologist what? As a general dermatologist, what sort of protective clothes are required? So, in other words, if you go to the clinic and then in every day, what do you think a general dermatologist? should be wearing to protect himself and also his family when he goes back. Because I wanted to ask the other question is that, so we, some of us wear scrubs and all that, we go to the clinic. And then we bring our clothes back home to wash, you see. So will you get contaminations on your, for, for, on your clothes and you bring it home to spread to other members of the family? Or should we clean our, change our clothes before we go home? Take a shower, you know, and uh, clean ourselves up. Richen. So based on anecdotal experience, what I do is I wear the scrubs and then I change out before I go home. And then I take the scrubs and I wash it separately. At home? Yes. But I wash it okay. separately <laughs> with very hot water as Dr. Sullivan has suggested. And, John, and I think, uh, as you said, I think that, that's sort of similar there and I think there are I think there's a very low risk with shoes in that there. So some people take their shoes off before they enter the house and, and leave it at the door <laughs> and put them on when they're leaving. But I think as you said, it, it's a balance. But I think yeah, we don't have a shower at our work, but we do change our clothes. But I thought next time we do a renovation, we'll have a, a shower as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. So next time all of us may have to do our cleaning up before we go home. Um, there's one question on the use of a face shield. Uh, <clears throat> I find it diff very difficult to examine skin lesion using a face shield, from a, especially from a distance. Do you have any tips to help to improve the vision and the visuality? You know, the curved face shield sometimes reflects light, you know, and then you see the flashes at the corner of your, uh, your, your, your eyes and then you can't see the lesion properly. Any comments? And, Pick it off. And I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, for us, we're sort of lucky. I think I, I, I do have a really nice quality sort of eye shield, which, which doesn't reflect. But I think yeah, most of my colleagues would find a, a face shield really hard to use. And it's only the minority of people who have sort of persevered. And yeah, most of us as yeah, relaxed, unfortunately, now PPE. So hopefully we don't have the same risk where we are. But yeah, face shields are difficult, I think. Yeah. Vijayan, do you have any comment about that? Any tips on the use of face shield? 
Not really, but I think if the vision is a problem, then perhaps you want to take a high resolution photo first. So then ask the patient to take a high resolution photo and have a look at it later. Because the idea is you want to keep a distance from the patient. Okay, I think we have run out of questions, but there's a question that I want to ask and that is cost. You know that we have to do so many things now and we have to put on masks, gloves and all sorts of things now and then you have to have special filter and all that. That will invariably increase the cost of a consultation and, manage and treatment. So what should we do? Do we pass the cost to the patient and tell the patient you got to add another 100% of the cost of your previous treatment? Any comments about that? Either Hui Chen or John? And I think that's a hard one because I think patients, they, they want to sort of know that it's safe to come and I think we do have to get their confidence first. And I think at the moment, you know, our GDP has gone down. A lot of people's salaries have dropped too. So I thought I'm just sort of grateful. We're, we're lucky with our job that, you know, we've, we've got at least a sort of a minimal steady income. So I think at the moment, we probably won't be reviewing our prices for at least another year. But if, if you don't raise your price, you'll be running at a loss for very lightly. And I, and I thought the other bit, we keep our clinic very cleanly and it's nice when you hear comments from patients that oh, I knew if anywhere was going to be safe to come during the pandemic, it's, it's your clinic. So I think as you said, people will pick and choose where they go. So I think if you don't have those standards, you might have no patients as well. <laughs> okay, we come to the end of the session now. It's exactly 8.30 now. So it remains for me to thank John and Hui Chen for the very excellent presentation. And I think there are a lot of very positive comments about the, um, the uh, lectures. And it's, uh, we want to thank Index for organizing this uh, event as well. We have another one on acne, management of acne and management of acne scars this coming Friday. So some of you will, most of you will receive the invitation again. And then for the, uh, uh, Certificates of attendance, if you all will follow the link that they, was, they will uh, flash out afterwards, jury will flash it out. And you just follow the link and then you just click onto it and then they will then send you the uh, certificate of attendance for all of you. So we end here and thank you very much, all of you, John especially and Hui Jian, and all the thank attendees you. of the participants that have been uh, asking questions especially. Thank you very much and good night. Have a good night's rest. Thank you everyone. Um, before we lock off, um, please note that the link has been shared in the um, all panelists. Kindly uh, click on to the link and uh, fill up the few questions and download your certificate. And once again, thank you and have a pleasant evening. <laughs>